make that song our prayer, God. God, that spirit of wisdom, God, let wisdom, God, fall in this place, in this room this morning, God, to open up our eyes, God, to see you for who you are, Father, and the world for who it is, God. Spirit of revelation, God, we invite the Holy Spirit to bring revelation to us today, God, to open up our hearts, God, to understand the truth of what your word says, Father, God. I, I pray, God, as the word is going forth today, God, for wisdom and revelation, Father. We invite your Holy Spirit, God, to, in, to invade this place, oh God. We come against the enemy, God. I rebuke a lying spirit from this place, Father. I, I rebuke a spirit of error from this place. I, I come against that in the name of Jesus. And God, we walk in the spirit of truth, Father. We walk in the spirit of truth in this place, oh God. Jesus, we are here for you. Jesus, we are here for you to worship you, to glorify and magnify your name. Have your way, God. Have your way today, Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. Go ahead and release our children to go. And I just want to say welcome back, worship team. You don't realize how much you miss them so they ain't here. And then and it's like, wow, we needed that. <laughs> so that was great. All, everything was great today. All the songs and everything was, was so good. So praise God. Uh, Lee mentioned uh, uh, Lake Charles, and, uh, you know, we, we don't want to forget them over there. Uh, I got a lot of family. My mom, my whole side of the family on my mom's side uh, is from Lake Charles, Welch area. I know I think Travis has... Sister Denise, I think, has family in that Roanoke, Jennings, Welch area. But um, that used to be our family vacation every summer. You know, when you, when you lived in Chalmette, if you left Chalmette, any place you went was a vacation. And Lake Charles was the spot. But I want to tell you, we had some of the best memories. All my cousins over there, my aunts and uncles and stuff. And many of them are still there. But we got a team going from this church here in Covington that's going to go. We're either going to leave Thursday night or real early Friday morning. And um, that's Jimmy Keller. I didn't, man, you, well, you snuck in here? Good to see you, Jimmy. How you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I know that guy. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> Do you go to Lake Charles for vacation? Do you? <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, we, um, we had a good time there. So a lot of them are going to be there. And uh, I talked one of, one of the most of the people that we know that are there, their houses were remarkably very little damage. But I do have an aunt, my mom's sister, that her home, she thought she was OK. And some of the shingles that peeled off the roof and water had penetrated the house. And they thought it was just a little water damage. But it ended up being enough to where the whole house is going to have to be destroyed. So um, but other than that, all of them are really protected. They're all safe. But I know how it was with Katrina. We really have to continue to remember them and our prayers, and we're going to go, you know, not with just the physical work we're going to do, but we're going to try to go with the, with the promise and the hope and the love of Christ and just pray for them and just really, you know, be there for them. So, but praise God, as I um, begin this morning, um, I wanted to ask a question. Have you ever drawn a conclusion on a matter without having all the facts? <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of that, and Lori could probably vouch for me that I do that a lot. I'll, I'll <laughs> I'll look at something or I'll see something and I'll come to a conclusion right away. And before, and, I've, and usually it's a negative conclusion that I've come to and before I really knew exactly what the facts were. And you made a decision on a, or, or a judgment based only on what you knew or understood. And uh, only looking at something or someone from our perspective can sometimes prevent us from having a, a complete understanding of that situation or person. And I, and that really kind of falls in the category of judgment. That's not what my message is about. But, you know, we look at someone and we might see someone's life or whatever, whatever we recognize about them or whatever we observe about that person, and we might cast judgment on them based on what we see, but we really don't have the, the, the entire picture. And a lot of times you may have judged someone, and then when you found out later on what it was all about, you were like, I got that wrong. You know, I was judging them, you know, and... Uh, so um, 
But the cross, the cross, I believe, is an example of this. And today, in obedience to the word of God, we are remembering the cross. Um, Jesus told his disciples in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it's interesting for us to pay attention to that scripture verse that Christ spoke there, but Jesus said, do this in remembrance of him. You know, we don't just remember the, the communion, the actual communion itself, but Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, in what remember, remember what I, what I have done. So communion or the Lord's Supper or the Passover, we, we, we call it, God instructed the nation of Israel to celebrate Passover. So it was after God had done, if you go back in the Old Testament, you know, the, the, the original Passover was in, was in Egypt when uh, God, God said that there was going to be a death angel that was going to pass over, and God instructed the, the Israelites to place blood over the doorposts and the door frames of their home. And, uh, and when, the, when the death angel saw the blood, the Lord said the death angel is going to pass over. There's no death going to fall in your home if, if, if your home, if the, when the death angel sees the blood. So God wanted them to remember the Passover to never forget the great deliverance he gave them in Egypt. But not only were they released from their captivity, they were spared from the, destru they were spared from the destruction of the death angel. So this is what we remember and what we celebrate. However, we are, we are only looking at the cross or are we only looking at the cross from our perspective? This is what I want to look at today. Do we only consider the benefit we receive and the sacrifice that was, that, that was made. And um, so that's what I want to look at. And I really want to, I just want to, hopefully, and I, that's why when, when we sang that song, Spirit of Wisdom and Spirit of Revelation, I'm, I'm believing that, God, this seems a little hot here, the mic, is, 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 I don't know if it's coming across, it's, it's reverberating back to me a little bit. I'll talk kind of loud already, but, uh, but um, I really want Revelation to come today. And, and you know, when you read the Bible, you know, we can study a subject we can study a subject for decades, but God can still bring a deeper understanding and a deeper revelation to that subject. And I believe that's what God wants to do today. So, so I'm believing that when I get finished with this and we come together and celebrate the Lord's Supper today, that somebody, at least one person in here, is going to be as excited about this as I am. I'm, I'm, I'm just believing that with all my heart that's, that, there's gonna, that we truly will celebrate this revelation that, that I believe God's going to give us today. But when we think of the cross and we, we look at the cross from our perspective, these are some of the words that we would normally associate with the cross. Love. Love would be one of them. I, I think that's probably the, one of the most primary words that we would use. Um, we, when, when I see the cross, I remember the love that God had for me. And the Bible, the Bible says, for God so loved, for God so loved the world, for God so loved me that he gave his only son, the Bible says. So love would be one that we would associate the cross with. Another word that is very common that we would use to associate the cross with would be grace. We remember the incredible gift was given, though we did not deserve it. It was the grace of God, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest no one should boast. In other words, there's nothing to boast about because you didn't do anything to deserve it. The Bible says it was the grace of God. And then another word that is probably real common when we think of the cross is sacrifice. We remember the offering. Jesus was willing to give himself as a sacrifice for my sin. Hebrews says, and, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then another word that we would probably associate the cross with would be forgiveness. We remember our sins are removed. The Bible says when you were dead in your sins and in, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. And each of these words are appropriate. Love and grace and sacrifice and forgiveness and, it, uh, and all of what we should remember when we celebrate communion. However, these are all looking primarily only from our perspective. In other words, these are the benefits. These are the things that when we look at the cross, we're looking at it from our perspective. This is what God has done for us. And rightfully so. Those are the things I believe that God would have us look at. Um, but what if I told you that there was another perspective? 
another, another dimension, if you will, of the cross. Take, take the cross and maybe consider that you, you've only looked at the cross maybe in one dimension, but God wants to flip the cross around and say there's a whole other dimension that possibly most of us have never really considered. It's looking at the cross from God's perspective. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And I titled the message today, The Cross, Saved from the Wrath of God. Saved from the Wrath of God. And uh, I mentioned this book that I'm reading, and I've probably mentioned it several times, and I'm going to continue to mention it as long as there's something in it to mention it about. And it's called Knowing God. And um, I, I'm just, I just want to tell you, if you don't remember the book, then you don't remember the book. But if you do remember the book, I just want to tell you, other than the Bible, it's probably one of the most remarkable, instructive books I've ever read. It's, just, it's, absolutely, it's an older book. It was originally in, uh, printed in 73. Then there was a revision, an edition that was done in 1993. So even, even from 93 to now, it's still obviously an old book. But it's authored by a gentleman named J.I. Packer. And it, it, I'm telling you, the book is unbelievable, but there's a chapter in the book that, that he titled called The Heart of the Gospel. And um, in, in that chapter, he gives us a look, the writer gives us a look at the cross from God's perspective. And in doing so, I believe we will have an even deeper appreciation of what communion really means. I mean, don't, don't, you, really, don't you really want to know the depth? That's what the Bible said, the heights and the depth of the love that God has for us. Like, like we can look at the cross and we can say, man, I'm just, I'm just so thankful for the cross. But when God, when God just takes that thing maybe to like another level, goes a little bit deeper with that thing, then God can even open up our eyes even more to have even a greater wonder and awe and appreciation that, that God, you did that for me, that this is what God did for me. And so that's what I'm praying that, that happens today. And um, uh, so in 1 Peter 1.16 it says, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, it says, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, retribution and the deliverance of justice rest with me. I will repay the wrongdoer, and again, the Lord will judge his people. So the first thing I want to look at when we look at the cross from God's perspective is this. God's holiness and justice requires a payment for sin. God's holiness and justice requires a payment for sin. See, to see the cross as God does requires understanding of who he is. God is holy and God is just. See, we can look at the cross a lot of times, and I, and I, and I do this sometimes. We look at the cross and we see the love of God and we see the grace of God and the gift of God and all the wonderful things that God has done for us. And we can almost look at it in such a way where we, are, where we, where we remove from our minds and we erase from our, mem from our memory that God is still just, that God is still holy. In other words, the, 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 the grace and the love and the cross and the forgiveness and all the things that we look at from our perspective doesn't remove who God is. God is still just. God is still holy. And so we need, we need to remember that that love and grace does not change who he is. God, that doesn't change who he is. So we must also consider when we look at the cross, and these are the words that no one wants to think about, but these are also words we need to consider. Justice and wrath and punishment and anger and holiness. If we're going to get the complete picture of the cross, see, not just the cross looking at it from our dimension, from our perspective, but when we turn the cross around and we look at it from God's perspective, now I'm getting a whole 360. I'm getting a whole dimension of what the cross looks like from God's perspective and from ours. You see, God's justice demands a penalty or a payment for sin. God's punishment for sin is not his decision. It's his obligation. Do you understand that? In other words, God just didn't decide, oh, man sinned, so now I must make a decision, do I or do I not punish them for their sin? It doesn't work that way. Sin demands punishment. God's very nature, by his very nature, God is obligated to punish sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's his obligation. That's not a decision, it's not a choice. 
He, he, he's mandated to do so. The Old Testament rituals of the sin offering was a picture of the punishment that sin required. When we look at the Old Testament and you read, you read all through the Numbers and Leviticus and Exodus and all the different things that God placed before the nation of Israel, God was doing all of these things as a foreshadow of the coming of Christ, of the, of the coming of the Messiah. But God was showing us and the nation of Israel what sin's payment required, what the, what the payment for sin, sin should be. See, although the sacrifice of animals could never remove sin, it foreshadowed the cross that death and blood were necessary for sin to be paid for. God was showing us in the Old Testament rituals that there had to be death. Something had to die and blood had to be shed for God, for God to, to, to do away or to, re, to, to, to take away his anger for sin. So look at this. This is a quote from the book that I'm reading the idea of propitiation, that is, of averting God's anger by an offering runs right through the Bible. And this is the word that the, that the author really concentrates on in this chapter is, is propitiation. And my, my professor up here in the front row is making sure that I'm pronouncing that word right because when I look at that word, I want to say propitiation. And that's what it it's, looks like. That's how it's and that's how it should be pronounced. And I like the way it sounds when I say it that way. And, but when I say it the way the professor tells me to say it, it is the right way because we Googled Siri and Siri came out and gave that thing where she says how to pronounce words and all of that. I don't like the way it sounds, but that's the right way to say it. So I'm going to say it the proper way. In Leviticus chapter 4, it says, If the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community... He must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He must present to the Lord a young bull with no defects. He must bring the bull to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle, lay his hands on the bull's head, and slaughter it before the Lord. The high priest will then take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle. The act of killing an animal was, God's, was God averting his anger and his punishment for sin away from the people and on to the sacrifice. Do you understand what God was doing there? God was showing us his holiness and justice demanded a penalty for sin, which in this case was a sacrifice for an animal. In other words, God's nature, God's holiness required that sin be punished, that, that sin be paid for. And God was willing to, to set up in the Old Testament a way by which the nation of Israel could avert could avert his anger away from them where it belonged to the animal. To, to, to the anger and the punishment was placed on the animal. So stay with me with this for just a moment. God's anger, not toward us, but toward sin. See, when we think of anger, we think, well, God, God is mad at us. God is angry with us. And that's not the case. It's God is angry toward sin. Look at this quote here. God's wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness. In other words, God, God is revulsed. It, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's revulsive to him for sin. The, the, in other words, he cannot stand in the presence of sin. God, God cannot stand in the presence of ungodliness or any unholiness. It, it's something that God's nature cannot even cannot equate with, cannot associate with, cannot identify with it, and it can have no part with it whatsoever. So by his very nature, God must punish that. God must punish sin. So when we think of God's anger, it's not anger toward us, it's anger toward sin. You follow? It's, a, it's what the Bible calls a righteous anger. God has a, has a right to do so. Now listen to this quote. This should really bring it all into perspective. God is not just... That is, he does not act in the way that is right. He does not do what is proper to a judge unless he inflicts upon all sin and wrongdoing the penalty it deserves. In other words, his wrath against sin is not only required, but it's justified. In other words, what the Bible is telling us is God would not be just. See, we look at love, we look at grace, we look at forgiveness, we look at all of those things. But God, by his very nature, would not be just. 
it would not be holy if God would have left sin go unpunished. It, it would have contradicted his very nature of who he was. So, see, so, so God, God, by his very nature, God had to punish sin. That, 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 that's who he was. That, in other words, he would not be God. He would not be holy. He would not be who he was had he left sin go unpunished. So the next thing we need to see is the cross from God's perspective. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God displayed publicly before the eyes of the world as a life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation, propitiation, by his blood to be received through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, which demands punishment for sin, because in his forbearance, his, his deliberate restraint, he passed over the sins previously committed before Jesus' crucifixion. So the next thing we need to see when we look at the cross from God's perspective is on the cross, Christ pacified the wrath of God. On the cross, Christ pacified the wrath of God. See, all of this, I think, is going to start to come into view now. God's attributes, his nature, demands a punishment for sin. He is not just if he does not punish. God would not be just. We, the sinner, are who his punishment should be directed. In other words, I sinned. The Bible said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible said, there's none righteous, no, not one. We, we, we are the ones that... Not only should his punishment be directed to, but deserve his punishment to be directed to. That, that's where it belongs. God, God's righteous anger, God, God's righteous justice. If God is who he is, his justice and his anger, it belongs to you and me. That's where it rightfully belongs. His wrath must be averted. Propitiation is the key word here. A lot of people just view propitiation as only the covering of our sin or the removing of it, but that's not the full picture. It is also the pacifying of God's wrath against us. See, that's when we begin to see the cross from God's perspective. See, the blood of Jesus was the atonement for our sins. His blood quenched the wrath of God and redeemed us from death. See, on the annual day of atonement in the, in the Old Testament, Two goats were used. One goat was killed as a sin offering. The other goat, the sins were placed on the head, and that goat was not killed. It was sent away, the Bible says. This double ritual taught a single lesson, that through the death of one substitute, which was Jesus Christ, God's wrath is averted, and our sins are borne away, out of sight. See, the second goat, the scapegoat, represents that which was accomplished by the first goat. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, he, he, our sins were forgiven. God, the, God's wrath was averted. Where was God's wrath averted to? It was taken away from us, from the sinner, and it was placed on Christ. And then the Bible says Christ also represents the scapegoat because where are our sins? The Bible says our sins are as far as the east is from the west. They, they, the, the, as, far, as far as they can be removed, God remembers them no more. Do you understand what this picture is, what God is showing is? God, by his justice and by his holiness and by his very nature, God had to, God had to have wrath on sin. God had to punish sin. God, God, in other words, there was a penalty for sin. And the Bible says the sin belonged to us. The, I mean, the, the wrath, God's punishment belonged to us. But God, but God so loved. But God so loved the world God, that God gave his son that what did he do? God transferred Get this, God transferred the wrath that belonged to you, and I guess where he put it? On his son, Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad? Aren't you excited? See, now we're looking at the cross from God's perspective. That God, yes, yes, God was angry. Yes, God had to punish sin. Yes, all of these different things. But God so loved, but God so loved that God said, I'm willing to sacrifice I'm willing to deliver to you my only son and transfer the, my wrath and my just, my just punishment off of you and onto Christ. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, thank you, Jesus. That, 
There should never be a day that goes by. We celebrate communion once a month. The Bible says do this as often as you want to do it. We can do it as much as we want. There should, be, there should never be a day that goes by in a Christian's life where, the, where that Christian is not on his knees and at least uttering the words, Lord, thank you for the cross. Amen. There should never be a day that goes by. See, and I've said this before to this church, and, I, and sometimes I guess I have a hard time. I feel like I'm not, like, how's the communication happening here? I think a lot of times Christians don't really value and appreciate what we have because we don't really understand what God has done. See, I, that, that's why I said spirit of, spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation. Open my heart. God, give us a revelation. Why shall I have an appreciation of what you've done for me? See, we let other things get in the way. We let other things cloud our walk as Christians because we don't really truly understand what God has done. The disciples understood, the, the, those who were Christ, they understood all of this stuff to the extent that they could. They appreciated the cross. We need to understand our position before the cross and without the cross. Where would we be? And that position that we would be in would be where we deserve to be. See, we think a lot of times, and I do this sometimes, we just, we just think that this cross and this grace and, this, and Jesus was all like automatic. Like it was just like we are so far removed from like the Bible and from Christ's death on the cross. We just accepted that that was just automatic and that was just going to happen. No, it wasn't. It didn't have to happen. God was under no obligation. God was under an obligation to provide wrath against sin. Great grace was, God was not obligated to provide grace. By his mercy and by his grace, the Bible says we are saved. Do you understand this? Get, ask God, say, God, give me a revelation of who I am without the cross and who I would be if Christ never came. God, show me so I can walk every day appreciating what you've done for me. God's got to do with that. Otherwise, we'll let other things become bigger than the cross, like COVID-19. COVID-19 ain't bigger than the cross. We Christians... We're born again by the Spirit of God. We're sons and daughters, the Bible says, of God. God, give us a revelation. Look at this quote. Without the gospel, the finally controlling reality on our lives, whether we are aware of it or not, is the active anger of God. That's where we are without the gospel. And that, that in other words, you see, again, that's God's nature. God's a God of justice and God's a God of holiness. God's got to, God's got to direct his anger and his punishment. It's got to go towards sin. That's where it's got to go. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was our substitute. His death and suffering was met for you and I. God transferred his wrath onto Christ. Now through Christ, God's wrath and his anger is pacified. His obligation to punish sin. And those in Christ are now forgiven and free. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. There, was an old, there was a phrase to an old song that, uh, that I forgot who, who, who used to sing this. The phrase went like this. Is, is that my cross? He's taken to Calvary. It, in other words, that was one of the lyrics in the song is, is that my cross? Yes, it is. It is my cross. That, that wasn't his cross. Yes, that was his cross to bear because none of us were worthy. That's why the Bible says worthy is the Lamb of God. W worthy is the Lamb of God that, that, Jesus, that Jesus was willing. Aren't you thankful that Jesus was willing? And see, this is another thing I want to say. And th this is something else to learn with this. We look, at the, we look at that verse and it says, God made him who knew no sin. But we know, see, if Jesus were to die and Jesus had no choice in the matter, what would, that make, what would that make God? That would make God a murderer. In other words, that would be murder because Jesus would have had no say-so in, in the matter. But we know that that's not true. Jesus said, no one takes my life, I give it willingly. Jesus got on his knees in the garden of Gethsemane. What did he pray? What did he pray? Father, not my will, but your will be done. See, he made a decision. But, but see, now get this. So you, you, got, you got to get revelation. God was under no obligation to, to, to provide salvation for us. 
but he, he chose to do so. But there was only one man worthy to do it. There was only one. And what if he decided, I'm not going to do it? There's only one. There's only one man, only one man that was worthy to do it. Aren't you thankful that Jesus answered the call? That God was willing, that Jesus was willing to sacrifice in our place, our substitute, that he was willing to take the wrath and the anger and the punishment that belonged to us, and it was cast onto him. See, we look at the, at the physical suffering that Christ suffered on the cross, but really that the physical part was probably not as much as the mental and emotional anguish that Christ suffered by bearing the sins of the world. Imagine that. Are, are y'all getting this now? Are, are you excited? Aren't you excited? We should be excited. There should be nothing that should depress us. We should never be in despair. We should never be in fear. There should never be anything that gets us down. This is what we were talking about today, the joy of the Lord. We should have joy. There's joy. What, 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 is, what is the world going to do? What is the world going to say? What are they going to throw at you that can remove what God has done? See, this is spiritual things. It ain't physical. It's spiritual. Rejoice. Rejoice. There should be rejoicing. There should be no despair, no fear. Perfect love, the Bible said, perfect love cast out all fear. Look what God has done. Look at Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him, and by his stripes... Wounds, we are healed. He took the punishment. He took our wrongdoing. He took our injustice. All those things the Bible said he took, Christ took on him. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? It's like when I was reading this. I, I mean, I, that's when I called Lee, because I know Lee gets people signed up to do communion. I said, Lee, I, I, I got I to gotta share this. Because I can't hold this knowledge in. I gotta, I gotta share this, and I'm reading this, I'm reading this chapter in this book, and, and I've heard of the word propitiation. I've studied it before, I, I, I knew all about it. But this guy has taken every single thing that I've ever learned about Christianity, and he's taken it to levels I couldn't think you could never go to before. And he opened up my eyes and I said, God, forgive me, because I was never really looking at the cross from God's perspective. <laughs> but now that I see it from his and mine, man, am I ever thankful. <laughs> I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. So what should our response be to such a great salvation? The Bible says in Hebrews, how shall we escape? <laughs> how are we going to escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Have you ever thought of how? When I was, what, what, what are you going to go? What, 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 good works? Your religion? Government, man, institutions, learning, all these things. What, 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 what is going to be your escape if we neglect the only antidote there is for sin, which is Christ? So what should our response be? Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 gives us one. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We need to just offer ourselves, just, just what it says, what, what, did, what did Hebrews says is, it says, therefore, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. In view of everything that God has done, what's the least thing I can do, God? I can offer you my body. I can offer you my will. I can offer you my flesh. I can offer you my desires. I, I can surrender my body to you, Jesus. That's, that, that, that's the least we can do. We must die to sin, our flesh, and the world and be separate and holy unto God. Another thing we can do and we should do is go and tell others what God has done for them. Those without Christ, and we need to understand this, those without Christ remain enemies of God and are under His wrath and punishment. See, we only, we only get the benefit of the cross when we accept Christ. In other words, I, God, in other words the Bible says that God's punishment and His judgment and His anger remains. It remains against us for those who are not in Christ. That's why you better be covered in the blood. You better have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's going to be your only salvation. 
The Bible says that the world is not going to be judged and condemned because of their sin. But the, the Bible says that God's going to condemn us because we rejected the answer for our sin, which was Christ. Amen. That's how big salvation is to us, that God was willing to say, I'm not going to condemn you for your sin. I'm going to condemn you because you rejected the answer for it, Jesus Christ. So what can we do? We can go and tell someone else, look what God did for you. Look what God did. Not what, there's nothing you could do on your own. And then the third thing, and we're going to do that right now, is remember what God has done for you and remain humble and thankful for the cross. Where would we be without Jesus? Paul said, if I'm going to boast, there's only one thing I'm going to boast in. I'm going to boast in the cross. We, we have nothing to boast about. That's what I tell Chris. What are you, what are you, what are you boasting about? You, you ain't did nothing. You, you didn't, you didn't do, not only did you not do anything, you didn't deserve what you got. Why are you, what are you boasting about? Be humble and be thankful. Hallelujah. We can begin playing that music if you want, Eli, or whoever's got that back there. Thank you all for putting that together for us, by the way. And um, so we're going we're gonna to take communion here this morning, but I want to I wanna give, give an invitation. I'm going to ask everybody just to stand to your feet, please. Is somebody excited today? Yeah. Am I the only one that's excited? You know, God was, was showing me when we, you know, when we give this invitation for salvation, there might be someone in this room that maybe you've, you've prayed the prayer to receive Christ, but you've never made your decision public. You've never made a public, a, a public profession of your faith. And I believe that God would have us you know, be, be, be unashamed of the decision that we made for Christ. And so, so as I give this invitation, I, I mean, my gosh, after seeing what God has done on the cross and seeing what Jesus became as our substitute, how in the world can anybody reject this? How, how, how could you reject God's love? How could you reject God's forgiveness and God's mercy and His grace? So that's you today. Maybe you said, you know, I prayed to receive Christ in my heart, but I've never really made that public. I've never really walked in front of a group and said, you know what, I want to make my decision public today. So if that's you today and God's Spirit is just working as we take communion today, what a great way to celebrate your salvation by coming together with the family of God and taking communion together. So I'm just going to give you a moment right now. If that's you, just come forward. Don't be ashamed. Christ wasn't ashamed. He hung on the cross the Bible says and died for us if that's you this morning before we before we continue just make your decision public come forward and say Jesus I surrender my life to you I want to I want to give you my life today